Hello, this is Discover, and we take customer service very seriously. We know that if you have a question or concern about your credit card, that's a serious matter, and you need to talk to a real person about it. So we offer around-the-clock access to seriously talented representatives in the USA. Again, it's a serious endeavor. The only funny thing about it is Bob. If you call us and Bob answers, you're in for a treat. Get 100% U.S.-based customer service and talk to a real person day or night. Discover exceptionally common sense. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now get any breakfast sandwich for just two bucks. Available only through the app. Mobile order and pay available at participating McDonald's. McD app download and registration required. Welcome to the Barnyard with Steve Roberts. And as always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Roberts. And here on the hump day edition of the yard, I'm a little bit later recording than I wanted to be. Can't get off the phone, man. It's recruiting time. We're a week away from National Signing Day. So, of course, we're trying to get you guys information. Things continue to change. You just never know from one day to the next what things are going to look like. And here's the thing I want to say before we get too deep in the jug today. We did not get official visits last year. And some of you have forgotten what it's like to have these official visit weekends and all the anxiety that goes on with that and all the drama, and it shows. You've forgotten what it feels like, and it shows. This is not new. We go through this every single year. Are they going to visit Ole Miss? Are they going to come to Mississippi State? Are we going to have a kid flip? That's why you love it. You never know what's coming. And, and here's the deal. If it all went according to script, it wouldn't be nearly as much fun. So we're going to win some. We're going to lose some. We're not going to lose nearly as many as some of our self-loathing fans would suggest. We're going to put together a good class. We're not going to get everybody we wanted. I've said that for a month now. It's not going to be a clean sweep. No matter how it feels or how it looks from one time to the next, things change. They do. We do our best to anticipate the change and try to give you guys some advance notice over at jeanspage.com. But the reality of it is that sometimes we don't get everything. It's like we didn't get the Jahi Modis uh, news. I, I woke up, found out Sunday morning he wasn't coming to Mississippi State. Got this weird, eerie feeling that something wasn't quite right. I said, you know what, A, he's, he's going to go to church this morning, and uh, they're still celebrating for winning a state championship. And next thing you know, there's a breaking news out of the, uh, the 247 Ole Miss spirit, or, oh, excuse me, the Ole Miss site inside the Rebels that, hey, he's headed to Ole Miss. And so those things happen. It's not necessarily anybody's fault. It happens. And he, listen, here's the deal, too. And uh, I want to share with you guys, too, some information that I learned during, I guess, maybe post Flim Flam production. I had a former Ole Miss staffer tell me in their recruiting handbook, there's like guidelines of what they want to do, kind of how we want to rank and how we want to recruit, what the visits look like. And there's like a, a, there's a guideline. And one of the first things on that list is flip a Mississippi State commitment on signing day. Now, it may have changed since then. I don't think so. But under Hugh Freeze, that was one of their goals every single year was to flip a Mississippi State commitment on signing day. Some days they did. Some years they didn't. So we're always dealing with that. We are. And I know you hate it. I hate it too. And, then, and people wonder, like the Ole Miss folks, like, I don't understand why you guys dislike us so much. Well, this is part of it. This is part of it. But we're going to talk some recruiting a little bit later in the show. Before we get too deep um, into the show, wanted to uh, let you guys know, for those of you that hadn't paid attention, your defending national champion Mississippi State Diamond Dogs released their schedule yesterday. So let's give that a quick look-see before we get into um, some SEC football stuff. And then we'll do some recruiting. Got a great top ten list for you today. Our buddy Nick with another winner. I'll kind of set that up for you in just a second. But um, let's get into the schedule. Of course, we open with the three-game series, Valentine's Day weekend against Long Beach State. February 18th, that's the day your season open and make plans to be here. We'll then have a home game against Arkansas, Pine Bluff, and then Northern Kentucky. I don't remember us ever playing Northern Kentucky. I'll have to check the media guide. But we'll get Northern Kentucky. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday deal. That's your second weekend series. We get Grambling during the midweek, and then we'll travel to Southern Miss 
on March 2nd. That'll be Trustmark Park. Looking forward to that. I, I always enjoy going to those games at Trustmark Park. I do. I think it's really cool. I think the uh, the governor's game is really cool. you got state people on one side, all the maroon and white, almost people on the other side. And uh, it's a great atmosphere. It really is. And it's great that those teams are willing to go play in central Mississippi. So Southern Miss on uh, Wednesday. Then we go travel for the first time. We're, we're away from – Duty Noble Field on a weekend for the first time. We go to Tulane. And you remember how much trouble those guys gave us last year? Of course, uh, Oltoff has moved on. But we'll be in New Orleans. That'll be a great trip for all of us. It's kind of a post-Mardi Gras trip down in New Orleans. It'll be a lot of fun for us. It's always – road baseball is always fun. Then the next week in the midweek, you folks – you find folks in Biloxi. We'll be back down there at MGM to play Texas Tech. You know, we did that two years ago. Back in 2020, matter of fact, that was the last games of the season for Mississippi State. We win those midweek games against a really good Red Raider team. Tim Tadlock, one of the better coaches in college baseball. Tech is always offensively one of the better teams in the country. That'll be a nice challenge for us in the midweek. And then we get Princeton coming to Starkville. Princeton, the Ivy League, finally playing baseball again. We'll see how rusty they are. But, that, that, again, they're a team that usually contends you know, for the Ivy League championship and have an opportunity to, uh, to make the tournament. We'll have Bingington come in on Tuesday. A lot, of, a lot of new names on the schedule. And then we open SEC play on the road at Athens, Georgia. I'll be there looking forward to that. I get to punch my, the final numbers on my SEC bingo baseball card this year. The only two series, only two uh, facilities that I have not covered baseball for Mississippi State is Georgia and Missouri. We'll get to knock both of those out this year. So we'll be at Georgia. They're going to be really good pitching-wise. Scott Strickland's teams always are. Should be a little bit better. You know, they, they faded down the stretch last year and missed the tournament. So they will be a potential tournament team this year. We come back home and play Southern University, the winners of the SWAC last year. And then we get Alabama at our place. We'll be looking forward to seeing you, Coach Bo. Then we go to Memphis that Tuesday. That sets up the road trip to Bomb Stadium. We have not had a lot of success out there. And listen, Arkansas is going to be really good again this year. Not going to be as good as they were last year. They're still going to be really good. You can't call the cops now. Uh, but, yeah, that's going to be a, a very, very, very interesting series. You know, Bulldogs you know, got a couple of interesting road series pretty early in the SEC slate. So we'll get Arkansas here. We'll get UT Martin at home before we host the LSU Tigers. That's going to be a new look LSU team. Coach Jay Johnson, again, one of the better offensive minds in the game. They'll come in ready to go, loaded full of transfers. They're going to be an older team in many respects. It'll be interesting to see what they do pitching-wise, though. That's going to be the real issue for them. Of course, they had the big transfer from, from Arizona come in. But um, can they piece it together pitching-wise? And, of course, LSU always tends to have talent. Uh, last year was one of their better years, but um, we'll get them at our place. That'll be a lot of fun. Uh, our, excuse me. Alabama Birmingham will be in on uh, Tuesday, and then we host Auburn. Auburn was kind of built to win last year and then had some pretty key injuries early on on the pitching staff. Uh, those guys, you know, Jake Owen and, and, uh, and Fitz, those guys just, you know, just couldn't quite get it together. Later in the year, they kind of found their groove a little bit, but uh, – this is an Auburn team, too, that you know, probably needed to hit the portal a lot harder than they did. Really hoping the best for Butch, and I think they'll be okay. But um, that'll be a series we expect to take. Jackson State returns to Starkville on Tuesday, April 19th, and then we will travel to Oxford for a, a big series. Let me go ahead and tell you guys now, this Old Miss team will be one of the better offensive teams in the country. The issue with them, much like we saw last year, is going to be pitching. When they had good starting pitching, they were very, very good. When they didn't, they lost. But this is a team that's going to be able to swing it. Tim Elko, of course, comes back, which is a surprise to many. You know, the reality of it is I don't know that his stock's ever going to be any higher, but uh, he has a chance to have a really good year this year and potentially contend for the SEC Player of the Year honors. I mean, this is a guy who got a major league stroke, and, of course, uh, a lot of pieces around them returning. But can they pitch it? That's going to be the issue for them. Can they pitch? And then we go right back to Pearl the next week to resume the Governor's Game series. You know, we didn't play that game last year. They say it was a mutual decision. I don't believe that it was. 
but the reality of it is we'll see Ole Miss four consecutive dates there late in April. And then we board the plane and head up to Como to take on Missouri. Missouri, I've been up there to cover football, and I've been by the baseball facility while I'm up there, and it, it is not on par with what we have in the rest of the league. But the last time we went up there, we didn't play well. So we're going to have to go up there and figure that out. And that's going to be a big road series for us late, not because of who we're playing, but because of the fact that uh, they came in here and beat us last year. And we hope to be playing for a potential top eight national seed so we can't afford to drop any games. And then Florida comes in. How about that? Florida. Not sure what to make of Florida just yet. I've read some fall baseball reports from them, and you know, there's been some inconsistency. Of course, they've got some sticks. They they hammered us in the SEC tournament. Glad we're going to get them here. You know, and I expect, too, the, the real challenge there in the East. I don't think Vanderbilt's going to be nearly as good this year, and it's a shame that um, – you know, we don't get a chance to play those guys. But, uh, you know, Florida, obviously a big series to open up the month of, uh, of May at home in Dirty Noble. Then we travel to Samford. We've been over there back in 2019 and uh, won the game. Kind of a Rowdy Jordan coming out party. You know, Rowdy had really been struggling that year and goes over there and has a big ball game against Samford, including the game winning RBIs. And I can tell you, it was a small but festive crowd over there, especially when they got up on us early. So I'll be looking forward to that. And then... The road trip to College Station, Texas. Coach Schloss and those guys, uh, you know, year one for them. By the time we get there, they'll have a pretty good idea of who they are. I don't understand how Texas A&M can ever be average in baseball. I, I don't. I, I don't understand it. Now, facility-wise, you'd say, oh, man, the facilities are great. They've really kind of let that stadium, Bluebell Park, has kind of gotten a little antiquated. Now, it looks good on TV, but as far as the fan experience itself, they've kind of let it get old. It's a little dated. I'm sure they'll... Uh, Ross Bjork and those guys will put some money behind that now that uh, Sloss is there. But uh, A&M team, you just never seem to know. And we've had some success out there at College Station, and hopefully that will continue. But um, a big series. North Alabama comes in here on Tuesday before we finish up the SEC schedule against the University of Tennessee. Tennessee was an old team last year. People forget they went to Omaha. I'm sure they haven't forgotten, but they were, you know, if I'm not mistaken, the first team eliminated uh, at Omaha. I know they were on our side of the bracket, so we never got to see those guys again. But they were an old team kind of built. But uh, uh, Tony Vitello, one of the better coaches in the country, they have uh, committed to putting some money behind that program. So I think you'll see Tennessee get better. And here's the thing, too. If you're a Mississippi State fan, you want teams like Tennessee and South Carolina to get better. You can say, well, Steve, I don't understand. Well, here's why. Because we need those guys to take a win, a win or two from Vanderbilt every single year to give us a better chance to win the SEC. And, of course, that's always secondary to being a top eight national seed and having the ability to host a regional and a super regional at home. But I'd love to be able to put another banner on the wall, wouldn't you? And so in order for that to happen, we need the East to be a little bit better. Because Vanderbilt has kind of benefited, you know, not to take anything away from them. They have been outstanding. But they have not had the same grind that we have had having to play in the SEC West. And, again, it's another thing that I go back to about all the scouting rotation, and it's, you know, football and baseball are similar in this respect. The West is just better. You say, well, they've got Vanderbilt. They do. They do. And they have Florida. And that's pretty much been it lately. So we need South Carolina to get better. We need Tennessee to be better. We need Kentucky to be better. We don't need to go into a weekend expecting Vandy to sweep or Vandy to win every series. We need that, that side of the division to be better. Not only does it help us uh, kind of maintain ourselves in the race for the SEC crown, but also, too, I think it helps our league RPI. But the reality of it is it's going to be a good schedule. I don't see a lot of stuff on here in the non-conference that really scares me. And you, we should, you know, Long Beach State, they're a good program, and they always have been. We went out there and lost that series, which is kind of a coming-out party for Will Bednar a couple of years ago. But, you know, there's just not a lot on here I look at. Of course, the midweeks down in Biloxi against Texas Tech, uh, that'll be big. And listen, I, a tip of the cap to Chris Lamontis for bringing the Bulldogs on the road around the state of Mississippi for those of you that perhaps can't get to start well very often. It's great. Two games in Pearl, two games in Biloxi, and, of course, uh, a ton at Duty Noble Field. Go ahead and order your season tickets today if you hadn't done so. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys out here. It's going to be a really, really exciting year, and, I, and I'll go ahead and say it now. I expect us to be back in Omaha. Don't know if we're going to win it. 
but I think we're going to be a much better offensive team. I think we're actually going to be better defensively. We got some guys that can really swing it. You know, we got to get Kelvin Clark comfortable out there in right field, and we got to settle this pitching rotation. But uh, based on the job that you saw Scott Fox all do last year, I think you can feel pretty good about uh, the direction of the pitching staff. We have recruited really, really well. Now, of course, we don't know that we have a Will Bednar on the staff, but let's be honest. Did we know last year that Will Bednar was going to be a first-round pick? And he had some ups and downs throughout the season, too. You know, early in the year, you know, Christian was the guy that was kind of up and down, and then you know, he kind of pieced it together at times on the road. But in reality, we did not have a dominant starting staff last year. Of course, Bednar was money in the postseason. When he became the Friday night guy, things really exploded for us. But, you know, Christian was up and down. Uh, Houston Harding, of course, uh, did a good job for us at times. Uh, Jackson Fristo was up and down. And so it, I remember sitting on press row at Omaha telling Dave Murray, I said, isn't it a trip to think that we're about to win an national championship with only one true starting SEC pitcher on the weekends? It's because of the inconsistency we had last year. You know, of course, the bullpen bailed us out a good bit. Now, establishing those roles will be crucial for this year. But uh, just wanted to share that with you. It's, I'm excited. You guys should be as well. We're just over two months away from watching the Diamond Dogs being back on the field. Really excited about that. You should be as well. Let's thank our good friends at Bulldog Burger Company, longtime sponsors of this show. I love partnering with them. I love doing business with winners because I see myself as a winner. So winners kind of stick together. That's what I try to do. Stick with the winners, they say. It's a winning combination at Bulldog Burger Company because you get the great spring rolls as your appetizer. You get a great restaurant-quality hamburger. You get that chocolate shake to go as your dessert, not to mention great service, great portions, great price, great atmosphere. How could you go wrong? Where else are you going to go eat? Bulldog Burger Company. Part of a great family of restaurants that do a wonderful job servicing Central Mississippi and the Golden Triangle. They know how to feed folks. And if you're hungry, that's who you should send your business to. People that know what they're doing. Part of a great family of restaurants with the Eat With Us group. Go to eatwithus.com today and order some gift cards for those hard-to-buy-for friends of yours. If you get to eat with us cards, you can eat at any of the family of restaurants and, um, and enjoy some great cuisine. Right now, we're kind of favoring Bulldog Burger Company. Matter of fact, we'll probably head there, um, probably eat there Friday night, probably leaning towards that. Be a good way to kind of end the week. Excited about what is to come, for sure. Uh, go by and check them out today. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, and the brand new one, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Go by and check them out today. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, so on Monday, we spent some time kind of breaking down the bowl matchups and talking about how geography played a factor in the bottom half of the, uh, the SEC bowl tie-ins, and it makes perfect sense. But let's go back and review, too, and let's see how everybody did in, in relation to the expectations. Now, we have our expectations. The SEC media has their expectations. A lot of that stuff's always wrong. But let's go back and look. And I pulled this up earlier. It was an article uh, written on 247 Sports by Brad Crawford, but it was based on the projected win totals uh, by William Hill. And you guys that are in the betting community know exactly what I'm talking about. So here is how it kind of breaks down. This is via Caesars Sportsbook by William Hill. This was their projected win total for every team in the SEC. Projected win total for Vanderbilt was three. Three. And even with those modest expectations, the Commodores underachieved. Just the two wins. And you remember both of those were, uh, you know, late, late exciting wins. That's not to say that Bentley didn't play well at times, but um, not a good year. Not a good year in any respects. And, of course, first year, we're not going to judge Clark Lee uh, for this one. This is a, you know, hard-nosed guy that's from Nashville and He'll know how to recruit there. But uh, the reality of it is, is when they pick you to win three and you win two, it stinks. South Carolina Gamecocks, one of the better overachievers in the uh, SEC this year. Happy, 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 happy for Shane Beamer. Projected win total for the Gamecocks this year was 3.5. I don't know how you win half a game. But 3.5. 3.5 win total for South Carolina. What do they do? They win six. 
ahead of schedule. Not only did they win six, they won three SEC games. And a lot of people didn't even expect them to win an SEC game outside of Vanderbilt. But you beat Florida. How about that? So six and six for them. So we got to give Shane Beamer and those guys a gold star. For year one under Shane Beamer, definitely ahead of schedule. The Arkansas Razorbacks, Sam Pittman, year two under Sam. You know, we had to think, too. Last year, you know, Sam and him, they were like, oh, you know, Arkansas is you know, better, and they won three games. This year it's different. They are better. Now, they're an older team, so they should won. They should have won. But the expectation, the projected win total, five and a half for the Razorbacks. So on the borderline of not even making a bowl game, and Sam and the boys go eight and four. Now, you could argue – they could have been could have been better or worse, like all of us, right? They could have easily beaten Ole Miss. They could have easily lost to Mississippi State. They didn't. So they could argue, hey, you know, we're a couple plays away from being 9-3 and three or 7-5. and five. But either way, better than expectations. We'll be eager to see what Sam and him do next year, though. They had a lot of veterans on that team this year. Now, of course, KJ's back. You know, they'll be a good team. They'll be a good bowl team next year, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. You're Mississippi State Bulldogs. Now, many of you, of course, and I love you all to death. Some of y'all make my head hurt, but I still love you. I'm sure your mom probably has said the same thing behind your back. I love you, baby, but you, you make my head hurt. So, projected win total for us was six. Now, many of our fans, of course, didn't have us winning the game. Um or if we did, oh, we'll win a couple or whatever. You know, oh, the Mike Leach experiment's failing. I hadn't read that in a while. Will Rogers can't throw the football. Will Rogers a D2 quarterback. Will Rogers got a noodle arm. And all he did was put together, uh, you know, the, the third most prolific passing season in the history of the SEC. We get through the bowl game. He'll be second all time to Joe Burrow who had one of the greatest seasons in the history of college football with 60 touchdowns and six picks, won the Heisman Trophy, and an NFL championship. So maybe we can have a little more confidence, guys. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe we can develop a little more self-esteem. So six wins, and we, we hit it and beat it. Seven and five for us. I have spoken about this ad nauseum. Seven and five is what I set the over-under. We hit it. I was hoping for eight and four. We very easily could have been eight and four. We very easily could have been six and six. And that's kind of Mike Leach experience, right? You know, you, you lose to a bad Memphis team that struggled to get ball eligible, and then you beat A&M on the road the week before they beat Alabama. Interesting, right? But Mississippi State will give the Bulldogs the nod here for exceeding expectations. The Tennessee Volunteers. Projected win total, six. What do they do? Basically the same thing Mississippi State does, seven and five. Now, you could look back and say, you know what? They probably should have beat Ole Miss. And they probably should have. But they didn't. Ole Miss went into New England, won the game, and then Tennessee people threw mustard bottles, which is still really, really weird. Who brings mustard to a football game? I, I can understand bring it to your tailgate, but why would you smuggle in a mustard bottle? But Josh Heupel, year one, I think most people thought they would be kind of downtrodden and a little bit defeated. And give that guy some credit. Give him some credit. Seven and five, playing in the Music City Bowl. Maybe the last ball game for a while, guys. But um, I think Josh has kind of got him on the right track. Your Kentucky Wildcats. I know some of you are fans of Kentucky, are fearful of Kentucky. Their projected win total was seven. I thought that was too high. I was wrong. I was. Some other people projected them to be double-digit game winners this year. They were wrong. They were closer to being right than I was, though. Kentucky goes 9-3 and three on the year. And when you look at the schedule, too, Kentucky – I mean, Mark Stoops done a good job up there. I mean, I, listen, I know the reality of it is he's only a few games over 500. It was a pretty favorable schedule for those guys. You know, they get off to the, uh, you know, the 4-0 start – 5-0, excuse me – 6-0. Yeah, 6-0 start against UL Monroe, Missouri, UT Chattanooga, South Carolina, and they beat Florida. And so, in hindsight, you look at this and say, well, wait a minute. You know, Florida was 6-6. Six and six. Missouri was 6-6. Six and six. South Carolina was 6-6. Six and six. They beat LSU. Guess what their record was? 6-6. Six and six. 
They lose to Georgia, lose to us, lose to Kentucky, lose to Tennessee. They beat Vanderbilt, who was two and ten. They beat Louisville, and so it's like, yeah, they won nine games, but where where's the signature win? Well, Florida, right? Well, they went six and six. They were number ten at the time. That things went off the rails. That was really kind of the unraveling for Dan Mullen. But while it is a nice record, there's not a marquee win here. And so at the end of the day, though, we evaluate teams based on wins and losses. So you've got to give a tip of the cap to Kentucky for exceeding expectations. Next team on the list of Missouri Tigers. Their projected win total was seven. Little did we know their defense would be one of the worst in Power Five. They had to win late to get to a bowl game. They end up 6-6. Six and six. And so, even with that, I think it's fair to say, even with a 6-6 six and six record, they underachieved and were probably very fortunate to make a bowl game. Because, like, you look at these other teams, you say, well, are you surprised that LSU's bowl eligible? No. Are you surprised Florida is? No. When you looked at how anemic that defense was, you think, man, there's no way these guys can make it. The Auburn Tigers, modest expectations this year for the Tigers. Seven. Seven was a projected win total. They finished six and six. And you can, again, you can kind of run this thing down here. It's like everybody was a little surprised that Auburn wasn't better. But, again, you look back at preseason expectations, and nobody expected them to be world beaters. And, again, this is the year. This is the year that they have the schedule – in their favor where they get Alabama and Georgia at their place. They got off to such a great start, though. You remember? 122-10 to 10 against Akron and Alabama State. And everybody's like, man, this offense is humming. You lose to Penn State. You narrowly escape an upset against Georgia State. You beat LSU in Baton Rouge, and that was kind of Bo, Bo Nix's uh, big moment of the year. You get blasted by Georgia. You blast Arkansas, which is a quality win. And the next thing you know, it all kind of falls apart. It all falls apart after that. You lose to Ole Miss. Excuse me. They beat Ole Miss, and then they lose to A&M, lose to Mississippi State, lose to South Carolina, lose to Alabama. So you end the year on a four-game losing streak. Six and two, feeling great about life, rising all the way to number 13 in the country. And then you lose. And then you don't win again. A lot of people have wondered if uh, Harson might be a candidate for the Oregon job. I think he's probably there for a little while. Why would you make that move if you're them? I don't, you know, with the money that Phil Knight's throwing around, I don't, I don't know that you go get Auburn's coach. Hello, this is Discover, and we take customer service very seriously. We know that if you have a question or concern about your credit card, that's a serious matter. And you need to talk to a real person about it. So we offer around-the-clock access to seriously talented representatives in the USA. Again, it's a serious endeavor. The only funny thing about it is Bob. If you call us and Bob answers, you're in for a treat. Get 100% U.S.-based customer service and talk to a real person day or night. Discover exceptionally common sense. You know when you order a new video game or a golf club or a blender and then it arrives at your door, you get a little thrill. Imagine how much more thrilling it is when you order a new car. With Nissan at home, you can shop for the perfect ride and order it without ever having to go anywhere. Sure beats a golf club or a blender. Buy a new car entirely online with Nissan at home. Deliver direct from dealer to driveway. Thrill starts here. Services may vary at participating dealers subject to applicable law. See dealer for details. Okay, the Ole Miss Rebels projected win total 7.5. No way you can argue against it. Ole Miss exceeded expectations. And I think, really, I think one of the reasons it kind of kept the number down, and I think all of us kind of felt this way, was you just didn't expect the defense to make the plays that it did. Now, here's the thing. Total defense, they really weren't that much better. Scoring defense, they were. And they eliminated a lot of the big plays. And, of course, you had Matt Corral. And, listen, we tip our cap to him. He is a worthy adversary. Guy's going to make a lot of money. And um, no hard feelings, Matt. Go enjoy your life. But, uh, yeah, the – Ole Miss clearly exceeded expectations. 10-2 and two this year. I don't think many people outside of their own circle projected them to be a double-digit win team. But they were. And uh, finished third in the league this year. Going to the uh, Sugar Bowl. And so, and it really it galvanizes a fan base. And people always say, well, you know, they always get so 
motivated with recruiting. The things that I've learned about Ole Miss and recruiting, there are two times they really get motivated. They're always pretty motivated. But what really gets them motivated is a coaching change because they want to get the coach off on the right foot or when they win big. It's like, hey, we're just a couple players away from winning the West. And let me remind you, they haven't done so. Even with a Heisman caliber quarterback, I know he didn't make the top five, but let's give Matt Corral, let's give the kid his due. I mean, obviously he didn't get hurt. He probably uh, gets the numbers to get there. But the reality of it is I don't think he was going to win it. But even with the Heisman caliber quarterback and a veteran team, they couldn't get to Atlanta. That said, great year for Ole Miss. The LSU Tigers projected win total eight and a half. I think we all felt like that was probably a little bit lofty at the beginning of the year. I think we thought LSU would be middle of the pack. Little did we know that things were going to fall apart and Ed Orgeron would be fired. A lot of us thought Ed Orgeron would be gone at the end of the year. I don't think anybody expected to go the way that it did. And it, it is absolute chaos down there at LSU right now. Everybody's in the portal. Max Johnson's in the portal. His younger brother decommits from LSU. It's going to be a different deal. It's going to be a different deal. I think I guess I saw Bill Embody or somebody tweet earlier today that uh, you got to go back to Jordan Jefferson. It's the last high school quarterback to be recruited at LSU and complete his eligibility in Baton Rouge. That is a stinging stat. And you look at it and say, well, whose fault is that? Well, you know, it's a lot of people's fault. But it's an interesting statistic, to say the least. There are a lot of other teams out there that kind of, you know, exist on transfers and um, – you know, the transfer portal is probably going to make that a little bit easier livelihood. But uh, it's interesting, to say the least. But LSU clearly underachieved this year. 6-6. Six and six, They have to win that emotional ball game against A&M. And it always runs swan song there at Tiger Stadium. But they do. But, again, underachieved. The Florida Gators, your defending SEC East champions, projected to win nine. Nine games this year. I think most people felt like that was probably accurate. That's I figured – Florida would drop one they shouldn't and then lose to Georgia, and that would probably be it. Probably a 10 and 2 type team. I think that was probably a fair expectation. And even if they got upset twice, you know, let's say they lose to LSU again, which they did, 9 and 3 would have put them in the money. But instead, you're 6 and 6, and Greg Knox once again has to come and save you and get you to a bowl game. So, yeah, underachieved without a doubt. The Texas AM Aggies. Projected win total was nine and a half, which was ridiculous. That looks like free money, man. You know, listen, so basically what you're saying is they're going to win 10. Right? That's what you're really saying. They're going to win 10. They won eight. And how weird is it that to think that the year you finally get over the hump and you beat Alabama, you get swept by the Mississippi schools. You get beat by Arkansas. You start running the numbers back on this thing for A&M, it's like they go 4-4 four and four in the SEC in a year that some people projected them as a New Year's Six team. And, of course, they're going to get a decent ball game out of it because there's so much parity within the league this year. But you go all the way back to, you know, to the beginning of the season, you look at it, there was some issues. They struggled early on with Kent State. Of course, they put them away late. They went on the road to Colorado 10-7. Then you lose to Arkansas, lose to State, you beat Alabama, and then you beat Mizzou, you beat South Carolina, you beat Auburn, you lose to Ole Miss, you lose to LSU. So you didn't even have a winning record in the West. Interesting, to say the least. And people have said, you know, called Gus Malzahn for years, well, Gus is just an 8-4 and four coach. That's what he's going to average, 8-4. and four. One year he'll win 10, the next year he'll win 6 or 7. He's an 8-4 and four type coach. I'm, I think Jimbo has the same label. The Georgia Bulldogs projected win total 10.5. Well, we knew that Georgia was going to be really good this year. I think we all expected that. I don't think we expected Stedman Bennett or Stetson Bennett to be the dude. I think we all expected JT Daniels to be the guy in order for them to win an AFL championship. I felt that they would win the SEC. And then they lose the SEC title game. Again, we've talked about that. How do you bet against LSU? I mean, against Nick Saban in Alabama? It seems really silly in hindsight. It's like, how many times has he had to make us all look silly before we figured out? That said, great year for Georgia, 12-1. and one. They do exceed expectations in the football playoff race. Alabama Crimson Tide projected win total 11 and a half. 
So basically, William Hill Sportsbook was projecting Alabama to win the SEC. Well, they go 11-1 and in the regular season. And how do you say Alabama <laughs> – Alabama uh, underachieved 11 and five. I, I guess they just felt like they would sweep this year. They didn't. The one loss, of course, to A&M. But if somebody's picking somebody to go undefeated in the SEC, yeah, the field is kind of against that. But at the end of the day, in a year that Alabama was considered vulnerable, they're number one in the playoff. Talked about that on Monday. Again, Nick Saban, the greatest coach of all time. There's no question about it. I don't know what anybody says or does or or thinks. But Nick Saban shows us once again, if you doubt me, I will prove you wrong. So there you go. There's a little SEC report card, how everybody did against their projected win totals. It's always good to go back in hindsight. I think the the two teams that probably surprised me the most, and to be fair, Ole Miss is one of them, I thought Kentucky would be worse. I thought Missouri would be better. And, of course, Kentucky beats Missouri head-to-head early on and kind of kind of put Missouri in, in some trouble. And, of course, they have to fight back. Florida surprised me because I thought they would be much better. Knowing what we know about Dan and what they had returning, I think we all expected them to be a much better team. But I can't say any of it went to script other than Alabama winning the West and Georgia winning the East. Outside of that, it was a pretty fun year, wasn't it? I mean, it really was. I mean, you look back in hindsight, like look at the SEC West standings. Of course, many people projected Mississippi State to be seventh in the West. That shouldn't be the case next year. I think most people pick us middle of the pack. But most people picked us seventh, and we end up fourth. Tied for third, but of course, lose a top record to Arkansas. So, pretty interesting. LSU, your last place SEC West team. Auburn, of course, also with a 6-6 six and six mark and 3-5 and five in the league, but they went head-to-head in Baton Rouge. And who knew that would be the difference between 6 and 7 at the time? When Auburn beat OSU, it's like, man, what a huge win for Auburn. So, but, yeah, it was a great year. It always is. I think, I think when, it's, uh, when you never know from one week to the next what's going to happen. You know, some, some years it's like, well, this is, you know, you, you kind of know who's who and that sort of stuff. I think outside of Alabama and Georgia – there weren't a lot of great teams. Alabama and Georgia were elite. And then you've got a pack of teams right there, Ole Miss, uh, you know, Kentucky, I guess Arkansas. They were really good. Then you've got some teams who are pretty good like us in Tennessee. And then outside of that, it gets really muddy. The fact that we have, you know, 13 teams that have a chance to post a winning record this year after the bowl games, that's pretty impressive, right? I'd have to do the math on that, but I can pretty much tell you with some assurances now, that's never happened in league history. And it probably won't this year either. We'll have, uh, we'll have some teams lose their bowl game. But that said, we'll probably have a, a league record number of winning teams. Pretty cool. And, and there's so many people that hate the SEC, and this is why. Because we just keep winning. All right, time for today's top ten list. Brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's close, C-L-O-S-E, with Blair, B-L-A-I-R. Close with Blair.com. It's good to have friends in the business. It's difficult to navigate through a mortgage. For some of you, it's the first time you've ever attempted. Stick with the winners. Trust a true mortgage professional. Blair Chandler, good friend of mine, good friend of yours, good friend of Mississippi State's. Season ticket holder in multiple sports, has a place here, can be seen on campus regularly when he's not got his head in the laptop somewhere working to get a loan closed. Blair tells me that now's a great time to refinance your home. Interest rates are low, but they will go up. Take advantage of that. Perhaps consolidate some debt. Lower your overall monthly payments. Live life a little easier. And maybe you're looking for the dream of home ownership. Maybe you've been turned down before. Maybe you've never attempted because you just say, you know what? I just don't know if that's for me. As much as I would like it to be, I just don't know. Let Blair Chandler give you an opportunity to build a home rather than rent one. Blair's a guy, obviously, that knows what he's doing with 21 years in the business and a top 1% close ratio in the industry, not just in Biloxi, not just in Dry Creek, not just at Flint Creek Water Park. Nope. Blair gets it done. Licensed in multiple states, 
Give him a call or text today. Let me give you his personal cell number, 601-500-2344. Again, that's 601-500-2344. Pretty simple, right? And you're not going to just call some voicemail or speak to a receptionist and somebody dodge your message all the time. This is Blair's personal number. And if he gives you any trouble, you let me know. I'll take care of it. Today's top 10 list, and our buddy Nick, who I think has had half a dozen or so top 10 lists, Nick always has great ideas. Nick is like me. It's like, you know what, hey, maybe we didn't want to go to the Liberty Bowl, but that's where we're going. And so let's embrace that and let's celebrate Memphis. So today he kind of gave me a little bit of a carte blanche in some respects. But what about songs from Memphis, bands from Memphis, songs about Memphis, Memphis in the title? So this is going to be Memphis. Now here's the deal. No Elvis Presley, no Johnny Cash because that's lazy. We've already done both of those. But this is just about Memphis. Now, I took some liberties here because I wanted to kind of work in some classic stuff and some modern rock stuff. There's no 3-6 Mafia on the list, and they're a Memphis treasure. And that reminds me, let me tell you a quick story about 3-6 Mafia and Mississippi State. I don't think I've shared this with you guys before. When we went to the 07 Liberty Bowl, the 3-6 Mafia was playing a concert. In Memphis. And, you know, Sylvester Croom was a big disciplinarian. And he goes, hey, you know, listen, we're having curfew. We're locking things down. We're here to win a ball game. And so they weren't going to have the big party type week. They were going to have all the festivities. But after dinner, everybody had to go back to the hotel. But Titus Brown went to Coach Croom and said, hey, Coach, we would really love to go to the 3-6 Mafia show. Now, I'm getting this secondhand, so there may be a few details that are incorrect. And so Titus Brown goes to Coach Croom and says, Coach, we all really want to go to the show. The seniors will make sure that everybody behaves. There are no issues. Nobody's going to get in trouble. We just want to go to the show, and then we want to go back to the hotel, and then we'll get ready to go play the ball game. And Coach Croom, to his credit, said, I'll tell you what, I trust you guys as seniors to lead this team, so he let them go to the show. And they get to the 3-6 Mafia show, and then after a set change, 3-6 Mafia came out wearing Mississippi State jerseys. How cool is that? Really cool. And and the fact they're wearing the jerseys is just kind of a bonus, but it's the fact that Titus Brown and the leadership of your team went to Coach Croom and said, hey, we want to do this. And they do it, and then what do we do? We win the bowl game. We beat Conference USA champion Central Florida uh, 10-7. Derek Pegues, the most outstanding player of the bowl. All right, so no 3-6 Mafia on the list, but let's give a shout-out to those guys because we're still fly till we die. All right, so here we go. Top 10. Now, again, this is going to cover a lot of territory. Now, my, I'm a, I got to give a shout-out to, to my sister's favorite band, my sister Reagan. Love her to death. She is my baby sister, and I love her. But she doesn't listen to very good music. I'm just telling you. She didn't grow up with me, and I, and I think that's the cause of this. I think that's the root cause of the hipster music for her. But her favorite band is from Memphis, She wishes that I was a fan. I'm not. I know many of you may be, and you may think less of me, but the music just doesn't appeal to me. It's not anything wrong with it. They're very talented, but her favorite band is Lucero out of Memphis, and so I would be remiss if I didn't at least give them a shout-out as an honorable mention in honor of my baby sister, Reagan. All right, so here we go. Top 10, number 10, kind of an eclectic list, by the way. Memphis in the Meantime by John Hyatt. Check that one out. It's a little more Americana than I'm used to, but it's a really cool track. Now, there's a great rock band, and actually a Christian rock band from Memphis that has kind of crossed over. They're in the mainstream rock charts now, but they are, they're believers, and um, it's the band Skillet. If you're unfamiliar with them, you need to make yourself familiar with them. We've had a couple of their tracks on some top ten lists in the past. I really dig them. Uh, vocally, maybe not on the same level as, uh, you know, Miles Kennedy or Brent Smith of uh, Alter Bridge and Shinedown, but really consistent. I went, I could have gone with a number of tracks here. We could probably do a top 10 skillet list, but I went with Feel Invincible because I just thought that kind of fit with the bowl game. Now, going back to some Southern rock, I don't know that we've ever had this band on top 10 list, but we're going Dixie Chicken by Little Feet. There's a live version of that that has Emmylou Harris and Bonnie Raitt singing backup online. You can go check that out. It's uh, from the Saturday Night Special. Really, really cool. Number seven, 
another modern rock band. And uh, I liked him a lot better when Josie Scott was a singer. But sadly, Josie has had some addiction issues of, himself, of his own and uh, ultimately led to his hiatus from the band. And then there was some talk about them reuniting and recording some new music. It just didn't work out. But it's the band Saliva. They absolutely rock. I love the older stuff. Some of the new stuff is okay. But I went with my favorite Saliva song here, which is Always, Always by Saliva. That's number seven on the list. Number six, going back, kind of, a, kind of some country rock here. We went to uh, with Big Train. It's a long song, too. So when you turn this list on, you're going to listen to John Fogarty for a while. Big Train from Memphis, number six on the list. John Fogarty, of course, the legendary singer of Credence Clearwater Revival. All right, number five, this is one of the most underappreciated songs of all time. It is also arguably the shortest song we've ever had on the top ten list. So we're going to go from seven minutes from John Fogarty uh, to just a couple of minutes. Joe Cocker had a hit with this as a cover. It is not a Joe Cocker song, but it's the letter by the box tops. The letter by the box tops. Now, they were the first to record it, but it's not an original song. It's not a cover. It was written by Wayne Carson. If you guys are unfamiliar with Wayne, that's a guy you could probably uh, you know, do some research on him. He's a guy that um, was a major songwriter out of Nashville, wrote a lot of big uh, hits, including uh, Always On My Mind. How about that? So interesting track, to say the least. I love that song, and I wish it was longer. I really do. I wish it was longer. It's not long enough. But it's the Bach Tops. The letter, they are a Memphis band. Sticking with Memphis bands. I've had some interaction with Anthony Quarter over the years, and uh, I love this band when they first came out. Their, their debut album, Surprise Attack, is perfect from start to finish. There is not a bad song on it. It was an incredible debut. They come back and follow up. Uh, well, I guess Wild, Wild America was the, uh, the, the second album. Also really good. But it's the band Tora Tora. And the song is Walking Shoes. I think we've had that on before. I could pick a ton of songs and turn you on to Tora Tora. Anthony Quarter, his vocal range is unlike anybody else in the genre of kind of that bluesy rock. And what's so great is like they play some Memphis blues in addition to the rock stuff. But Tora Tora I, is a band I don't think fully got their due, despite the fact that... Um, they're very, very talented. You know, music was changing, and they weren't necessarily um, – uh, they weren't really in a situation where they were um, kind of getting washed up in the grunge thing. They were different from, you know, those bands from West Hollywood. They were a southern rock band with kind of a mainstream appeal, and uh, I think they were kind of unfairly maligned. I love them. You will, too. They're not hair metal in any stretch of the imagination, and um, – Hopefully, we'll get a chance to see him again soon. Number three, this is a, a song that has Memphis very early in the, uh, the lyrics, and I love this song. It is one of my favorite Rolling Stone songs of all time, but it's Honky Tonk Women. You know, the very first line, we talk about Memphis. And so it is a song about Memphis, but it's really a song about women. And, um, you know, the Rolling Stones obviously are a, uh, Legendary bands. I wanted to work them in today, too. Number two, many of you are probably expecting this to be number one. And maybe you haven't paid attention to the rules. I don't do slower songs or ballads as number one. But you couldn't do a list about Memphis without putting Walking in Memphis by Mark Kahn. I was actually a radio music DJ when this song came out. And almost immediately when we added it to the playlist, people were calling up requesting it. It, it is incredible. Music. I mean, it really is. Mark Cohn, an incredible singwriter. Uh, you know, I don't know what he's doing today. I, su I suspect he's still doing something with music, but um, if he's still living, I hope that he is. But th when you every time I think of Memphis, like I'm heading that way, it's like it's just kind of part of of your thinking. Walking in Memphis, it just immediately comes to mind for me. Number one, because I'm a rocker, and you should be too. I'm going back. I could have gone. There's a couple cover versions of this I think are killer, but I went all the way back to the beginning. It's all the way from Memphis, from Mott the Hoople. We have never had them on a top ten list. This is an absolute gem of a song. If you're unfamiliar with it, make yourself familiar with it. There's a, there's a super group called Contraband in the 80s that covered it. There's a lot of covers out there. 
I love the original better. Mop the Hoople, number one on today's top ten list. Songs from Memphis, about Memphis, or from bands from Memphis. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't men- mention Alex Chilton is a guy, too, that uh, a great musician from Memphis. I know many of you are familiar with his work, so I didn't want to let the list end without having an opportunity to share that with you. So there you go. Top ten Memphis-related songs. And check out that Tora Tora album. I'm not kidding you. I'm not. Surprise attack from Tora Tora. If you're looking for some travel music today, put that on. You'll thank me later. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Book Mart. Stand in man, Miss Kathy Brown, the lovely, talented Susie Candy, the whole crew there will treat you like family because in their minds, you are family. We don't have fans here at Mississippi State. We have family, even though we argue among ourselves sometimes. We all love the maroon and white. We want the Bulldogs to do well. You can rep the brand today by ordering more Mississippi State merchandise from campusbookmart.net. And it is Christmas time. Save yourself the hassle of going and fighting long lines and crowds and all of that energy at the shopping mall by visiting Campus Bookmart at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That's BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that'll get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than $50, absolutely incomplete. I think it's also cool, too, that uh, it's a Starkville business. I believe in shopping, eating local to support our small independent business people, especially those in Starkville. Many of you can't make it to Starkville for games. And you think, you know, I, I don't get to enjoy the full experience of the Mississippi State athletic environment. And so if you can't make it, you can still support Starkville by shopping local. Campus Bookmart, a Starkvillian institution. Give them an opportunity to serve you. Again, that's campusbookmart.net. Promo code BSR to get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. I wanted to go back and talk a little recruiting history here. I have some friends of mine that are big recruit nicks, and we we do this from time to time to kind of go back, you know, because we, we have these fun days on signing day, and some days are not so fun. And we look back and say, okay, well, we, we did really well, but did we do really well? Sometimes it takes a couple of years to kind of see these classes mature and understand exactly how we did. So let's go back to 2015, Mississippi State's last top 20 class. We finished 18th in the country, which was 8th in the SEC. Number one player in the state that year, Jamal Peters. Played a lot of snaps for us. Probably didn't fully realize his potential, but he was a good player here at Mississippi State. We moved in the corner, uh, and he had some big moments. Number two on the list, Leo Lewis. Obviously, a guy that people know well. Former Alabama commitment. And in the final days, this is one of those things, too. People forget this. You know, like he, he was committed to Alabama. State had all the momentum in recruiting and then we go to number one in the country, and out of the blue, Leo Lewis commits to Ole Miss, which made no sense whatsoever. Ultimately, he decommits from Ole Miss, and people were expecting him to go to LSU. And we didn't know up until maybe the last 48 hours that it was going to be Mississippi State. We hoped it would be Mississippi State. We didn't know. Leo, of course, had some moments at Mississippi State, did not have the career I think a lot of people expected him to have. But that was a big recruiting win for Mississippi State, to say the least. Fletcher Adams, also a four-star that year, came in, had a good career at Mississippi State, uh, probably a little overvalued as a prospect. He wasn't quite maybe what we had hoped that he would be. Uh, the Adams brothers had a pretty good stretch here at Mississippi State, though. Lonnie Adams produced some athletes there at Brandon High School. But Fletch comes in, does a good job for us. He and his brother Nelson Adams both uh, put together some good snaps for the Bulldogs. Malik Deer. Also a four-star that year. Uh, Malik Deer played really well for us and played a lot of snaps. Had the ACL tear and was really never the same. Got a little bit too heavy for the position. Uh, and Joe Moorhead and staff just didn't really find favor with Malik. And, and uh, he returned some kicks for us. But once Dan Mullen left, Malik Deer's production and role in this offense kind of disappeared. The next four-star on the list, Donald Gray. Donald Gray came in and did a great job for Mississippi State. And this, of course, the second time State had signed him after he was at Cole Inn. ended up playing three years at Mississippi State because he had the foot injury there at Cole Inn. So he redshirted his second year at Cole Inn, came here with three to play, and put together a really good career. Martinez Rankin ended up going to the National Football League, four-star, considered by many to be the number one junior college offensive tackle in the country. 
redshirted his first year. John Hevis, he told him, you're either going to start a redshirt. He ends up redshirting and then kind of came into his own as a senior. Had a decent year as a junior, a much better year as a senior. Uh, won the whole trophy award and ended up being drafted and uh, has spent some time in the National Football League. Final four-star on the list was Nick Gibson out of Pinson Valley, Alabama. Nick never really became the guy at Mississippi State. You know, State kind of recruited over him. He was a great young man and a good secondary back for us, but never fully, I think, achieved what we hoped that he would. It was a big get for us when we got him. Tim Washington out of Yazoo City. What's interesting with Tim is uh, Tony Wolfock told me that he was the best player to come out of Yazoo City since Fletcher Cox. Now, Tim didn't do a whole lot until later in his career, ultimately becomes a starter, plays more football for us as a senior than at any point in his career, and put together a good senior season. But um, we didn't get a lot of value out of Tim early in his year. He is now back with the program working in strength and conditioning. So still a Bulldog, still contributing to Mississippi State, and probably could have played more early in his career. Just kind of got down the depth chart a little bit, was more of a special teams guy for a while. But as a senior, I don't know that we uh, fully appreciated how well he played for us. Uh, Darrell Williams, a three-star, became a multi-year starter here at Mississippi State, spent some time with the Kansas City Chiefs, I believe he won the whole trophy award as well, definitely got our scholarship money out of him. Uh, Traver Young was billed as the replacement for Matt Wells, never really lived up to the hype. Uh, Traver's a guy, too, that uh, you know had some athleticism, but it just never really clicked for us here. He was a solid player for us, but never really a difference maker. Dedrick Thomas, the hero of Big Dog Camp that year, represented the offense, came in here as a three-star guy, and had a really productive career for us. You know, we don't beat Arkansas back in 2017 without him. He had the game-winning touchdown in that ball game. Dedrick Thomas, a very you know, consistent player for us, was never going to be the wide receiver for us. But, uh, again, we get our money out of him. Chris Stamps out of Warren Central High School. Chris, all kind of thin, loved him a lot. He was the uh, number one corner in the state that year at 6'1", 170. Struggled to put on weight. Got down the depth chart a little bit and ultimately transferred. Jonathan Calvin, a three-star standout defensive end out of Kapaya Lincoln. Came in, had a couple of really good years for us. His senior year, he was outstanding for us. Very productive player. Maurice Smitherman ended up being a starting corner at Mississippi State. And that was a big recruiting win for State. He had a ton of offers. Ultimately came to Mississippi State, elected to stay closer to home out of minor high school there over in Alabama. Had a really good thing going. The next thing you know, he has the ACL tear, and, and that was the end of his college career. Keith J- Joseph, God rest his soul. Uh, Keith, one of our, our better signees in the class. And, of course, he and his father, Keith, tragically killed. Uh, in a car accident, hydroplaned on the way to a high school football game. You hate that. Uh, Mark McLaurin. I had Mark McLaurin as a top 10 player in the state of Mississippi that year, and I believe I was the only one. We definitely got our scholarship money out of Mark. His coverage ability at times was a little bit off, but Mark put together a great career here at Mississippi State. Remember, he was the most outstanding player in the 2017 Gator Bowl. Kendall Jones was an Under Armour All-American that year. And uh, never really got on the field here at Mississippi State. Just It never came together here. Every year you're kind of waiting for him to make a jump. He never did. Uh, wish him the best wherever he ends up in life. Uh, Keith Mixon's the guy that was a fan favorite and really struggled to, to get healthy. He had uh, th- those weird ankle injuries, like he was like a foot injury, missing a bone or something, and they had to go in and do some fusion and was hurt a lot here at Mississippi State. Had a really big game against LSU back in 2017 and Keith, an electric returner, ultimately transferred. If I'm not mistaken, it was either Central or Western Michigan. Had a really good year up there. Uh, Alec Murphy was our second running back in the class out of Nixon, Missouri. Of course, he had some ties to Mississippi. I believe most of his mom's family is from down around Florence. But again, never really came uh, you know, to fruition for him. He spent some time at linebacker. It just never really worked out. Uh, great guy, ended up being a student assistant at Mississippi State, but uh, n- not a big contributor on the field. Justin Johnson, a good get by Jeff Collins out of Hoover, Alabama. Justin, we got our scholarship money out of him, to say the least, and uh, actually converted him to a tight end. We expected him to be a spread tight end. Made his college debut against Southern Miss, and next thing you know, he's in the end zone. Harrison Moon was an offensive tackle out of Signal Mountain, Tennessee. 
stayed here for a short time, and then ultimately transferred. He was best friends with Nick Tiano from the Baylor School in Chattanooga. Sister cities right there, Signal Mountain, just up the hill from Chattanooga. Both of them ultimately transfer. Uh, Nick goes to UT Chat. I think both of them ended up at UT Chat. Nick had a good career there. Jonah Spivey out of Bay Springs. I uh, came to Mississippi State, never really worked out, ultimately transferred. I have no idea where he ended up finishing out his college career. I thought he was a questionable take from the beginning because uh, some of his social media activity, he was very pro Ole Miss, and I really thought they were kind of setting up a, you know, a flip-type situation, but uh, never really worked out for him. And, uh, again, wish him the best. Anthony Mullins, Mullins from just across the state line in Aliceville, Alabama. Anthony came in expected to do some good things, had some off-the-field troubles, and ultimately left the program. Uh, for Rod Green, was kind of a throw-in. He was kind of the calf in the calf-cow deal with Leo Lewis. And it's Farad Green It's in the National Football League instead of Leo Lewis. And Farad Green, I'll be honest with you guys, when we had that, um, that three-day camp that year, Farad was awful. He was clumsy. And next thing you know, he gets an offer. And I don't know that I have ever seen a player improve from their junior to senior year of high school more than Farad did. It's like he grew into his frame. He found his dexterity, put together a great senior season there at Wesson, Came to Mississippi State. Next thing you know, he's Mississippi State's most reliable blocking and receiving tight end. Michael Story, the lowest rated member of the class, offensive guard out of uh, Ripley, Mississippi. Sadly, uh, he's more known for his off-the-field exploits than on the field, but he did play a good bit for us as a senior. So you look at it in hindsight and say, wow, we didn't have a lot of those guys go to the league, but we got a lot of snaps out of those guys. And I think that's probably a fair assessment. Let's go to 16 this number 16 class was ranked 28th in the country, 11th in the SEC. Uh, the headliners, and this is a year two, we didn't get Lashley, we didn't get A.J. Brown, and everybody was really upset. We got two of the four of the Golden Triangle uh, four horsemen. We get Jeff Simmons, we get Kobe Jones. Of course, Jeff, an outstanding player in the National Football League now, certainly lived up to his potential. First-round draft pick from the Tennessee Titans, probably about to cash in. Uh, Kobe Jones recently added to the practice squad for the Miami Dolphins. Kobe, a local hometown hero. A lot of people felt like leading into the announcement that he may ultimately go to Ole Miss. And there was never really a question about that. He was never going to Ole Miss. He did take like five official visits in about two weeks. He had a couple of one-day visits. He worked them all in. But there was never much doubt about him coming to Mississippi State. Marquis Spencer. Projected to be the number one player in the next class, but he reclassed for 16. And we got a good career out of him. And um, this is a guy that uh, practice squad the National Football League and really kind of came into his own later in his career at Mississippi State. Certainly feel like we got our value out of him. Uh, Jamal Couch, wide receiver out of Phoenix City, Alabama, ended up transferring. Just It never came together for him once Joe Moorhead and uh, Luke Getzey and those guys got here. He and Getzey just didn't seem out of eye, and ultimately he transferred out. And I think last I heard he was, what, at East Tennessee State? Uh, Errol Thompson. Remember that name, E-40? A lot of people thought, well, you know, he's kind of down the list. You know, the probably one of the more productive players we have had at Mississippi State on defense in the last decade. Certainly got our scholarship value out of him. Wish he'd come back one more year. Thought he had a chance to make it with the Atlanta Falcons. It didn't work out. But uh, Errol Thompson, a fantastic player and a great representat- representative of Mississippi State. Uh, Stuart Reese was a big late recruiting win for John Havasey. Big Stu came in, started for three years, and then transferred to Florida uh, as a grad transfer. Spent a year down there. And ultimately, I guess he's still there. I think, he, I think he's still there. I think he – yeah, maybe I'm wrong. But either way, uh, Big Stu came in, did a good job for us. C.J. Morgan was a big pick for up, pickup for us early in this class and was really kind of coming into his own at Mississippi State uh, as a safety. And then he had the major ACL and, and uh, MCL injury the same day that Tua went down. C.J. never been the same since, but a great young man who um, will be a Mississippi State alum and a true Maroon guy for life. Corey Charles out of North Florida Christian. I don't want to talk negatively about these guys. I always thought this was a little bit of a questionable take. I thought I didn't think his high school film was very explosive, but um, he was part of that great uh, you know, big dog camp commitment day when all these guys committed. And uh, Corey spent some time at wide receiver, spent some time at corner, and just never really found a true home position-wise here at Mississippi State. 
Dante Jones, we were really excited about him. You know, he was a wide receiver. Ended up having to go to prep school for a while to Jaira Prep. Comes back, kind of bounces back and forth between positions and never really hit his true potential. But, uh, you know, did have a couple good games for Mississippi State. But uh, really proud of him as a young man. Wish him the best. Uh, Lashard Durr, a former sign in place for us out of Colin. We got our money out of Durr, too. He ended up being a starting cornerback for us. Not an elite guy by any stretch, but certainly solid. Jordan Thomas, the tight end we signed from East Central Community College, ultimately went to the National Football League. 6'6", 275. A lot of people thought we'd put some weight on him and make him a uh, offensive tackle. We didn't. He was a real weapon for us uh, as a tight end. and But really probably found his groove in the NFL. Uh, Christian Roberson was a guy out of Powder Springs, Georgia. We were really excited about He came in, and it just never really clicked. He ultimately transferred out. Trey Brown was a guy that out of high school, I had him as a top 10 player out of uh, Choctaw Central. Outstanding player. Ended up going to junior college, comes back to state, and was just kind of a rotation guy for us. Never really uh, achieved our expectations for him. Uh, Cam Dantzler was a guy that a lot of people thought LSU might go back on late. They didn't. He comes to Mississippi State, foregoes his senior year, and is drafted by the Minnesota Vikings and now played in the National Football League. Greg Island's a guy we pretty much got by default. You know, we thought it was going to be an Ole Miss thing for a long time. We ultimately get him. And now he is on the practice squad with the Seattle Seahawks, if memory serves me correct. John Michael Hankerson, a guy out of South Bend, Indiana. His uh, father, Reggie Hankerson, a guy that I know really well. John Mike came in here, got, got in some off-the-field trouble, and was ultimately dismissed from the program. I probably need to check in and see how he's doing. Darian Parker, this is a guy, too, that was undervalued as a recruit, undervalued as a player, and undervalued as a prospect. Darian Parker played more snaps than any Bulldog on the roster last year. Could have come back for, you know, for a COVID year, ultimately decided to go and ends up on the practice squad with the Chicago Bears. I think he's still there. don't know for sure. But we certainly got our scholarship money out of him. Reggie Todd was a late signee for us. Had a great career, just didn't have a great career at Mississippi State. Ultimately dismissed from school, goes to Troy, has a really good career there. And then Osiris Mitchell, the last guy we signed in the class. And you would think, how in the world would we find uh, two six five receivers that had some real athleticism late? But we did, Reggie and Osiris Mitchell. Osiris, of course, uh, you kind of hit or miss at times, but uh, had a really good senior season for us and ultimately made the Dallas Cowboys practice squad. How cool is that? Let's look at a couple more before we move on. And uh, I just, I like to go back and look at this stuff and talk about them because, you know, it's like on signing day, it looks one way and then in hindsight, it looks another. The 2018 class, we'll wrap up with this one. We signed Devontae J- Jason, who was WAP. He ends up transferring. He comes to Mississippi State, really struggled to get open. He was a four-star kid, uh, four-star receiver out of Landry Walker High School. But he just it just never came together. And uh, even in, in spring and fall practice, he was a guy that struggled to get open, just did not have the speed as advertised. Uh, Dollar Bill Johnson, a guy that's still playing, uh, probably hadn't found – his niche just yet you know he had some issues with some effort penalties earlier in the year but has played well in stretches and is a guy too that we think that has found a home at guard and we need him to really step up next year uh big baby Jaden Cromedy you guys are really familiar with him guys still making plays for Mississippi State I think we I think is a four-star guy he probably uh was rated correctly Wide receiver Stephen Gidry out of Heinz Community College was a four-star. We did not get four-star production out of him. There were times that he showed some real flashes, but was very inconsistent. Jalen Maiden, quarterback out of Texas, came in, ultimately transferred. People called him Moose. Everybody loved him. He's a fan favorite. This you know, left-handed quarterback just never really came together for him. Uh, Marcus Murphy out of West Point. A guy that we all think an awful lot of. He lost his mom while he was here, and of course had a, a young son with a lot of a lot of medical conditions that he had to kind of work through. And Marcus ultimately decides to go pro. Probably needed another year, but a guy that certainly was an athletic and outstanding player here at Mississippi State. I feel like if he came back, he had a chance to be All Conference. Fabian Lovett, a guy that we were really excited about, played and started as a defensive tackle as a freshman. Ultimately left the program and transferred to Florida State. 
where he is now part of a program that has had back-to-back five winning seasons, five win seasons, and uh, out of the bowl picture. Aaron Brule was a late signee for us and a really good productive player for us. Recently added his name to the transfer portal. Hate to see that happen. Really like him as a player and a person. Jaquarius Spivey, another guy that uh, was kind of the hero of the spring game this year and then went in the portal and, uh, you know, wish him the best too. But he's one of those kind of guys too that kind of got caught in between positions. Is he a jumbo X? Is he a tight end? We don't use a lot of tight ends here. So there wasn't a lot of opportunities for him and uh, he elected to move on. Uh, Nathaniel Buki Watson, a guy that really wanted to play wide receiver. Isn't that crazy? He wanted to play wide receiver. He was talking about him visiting Ole Miss late. He was continuing to look for an opportunity on the Power 5 level as a receiver. Comes to Mississippi State, really struggled to learn the linebacker position the first year, and it's, it's new to him, right? I mean, it's not a criticism of him. And now he's one of the most productive tacklers on our team. It's taken a couple of years to get it figured out. This is a guy now that's doing a great job. Asias Furge, a former starter for us, now a second-team corner, probably getting our value out of him as a corner. Um, you know, he had a big interception against LSU. It was actually a bust on the play, but he, uh, he makes the play and kind of a game-changing play in many respects. Jalen Reed, an outstanding young man, has not played a lot of snaps at Mississippi State, was teammates with Baby and Lover out of Olive Branch. You remember State drops him and then re-signs him. You know, it's like Joe and them come in, were overcommitted. He cut some guys and uh, was really impressed by Joe. And I think Joe has come in here and, and worked hard. He just hadn't seen a lot of snaps, but he is an outstanding young man and, and um, glad that he will be a bulldog for life. He is, if I remember, mem- memory serves me correct, he's uh, getting his MBA. Sean Preston was a guy, too, kind of down the list. Not a lot of hype about him, but, you know, Sean Preston came in here and, and has done some nice things. A very good tackler against the run. Still kind of figuring out the coverage point at times, but he has made some plays. I think he's playing probably the best football of his career right now. Jed Johnson was a big recruiting win that year as we beat Ole Miss head-to-head for him. Lifelong Mississippi State fan with an Ole Miss mom and a Mississippi State dad. It worked out our way. Probably took a little bit longer than we anticipated, but Jet. It's really coming to his own this year. I think people are really excited about him. Uh, Devin Robinson was a defensive tackle out of uh, Memphis. And I remember they kind of thought he would be a defensive end. Even looking at him at Big Dog Camp, he just didn't really have the quicks to play on the edge. So he's going to have to slot inside and never really embraced interior line play, ultimately transferred. Uh, Cam Jones was a signing day addition for us that year out of Starkville High School. We take him away from UL Lafayette and DJ Looney late. Really upset DJ, to say the least. Uh, But Cam has been a very consistent player at Mississippi State. Your starting guard and uh, could be your right tackle next year. He's just kind of content to do whatever we need the team to do, so we're definitely getting our money out of him. Cameron Young, another late addition to the class out of Meadville, Franklin County High School. Cam Young has probably played his way onto some NFL draft boards for next year. I don't think there's any question that his best football lays ahead. And I give Bob Shoup credit after we signed him because this is a typical Mississippi State defensive lineman. This is going to be a small-town kid that really plays his way into some opportunities because he's going to work hard. He grew up working hard. Brad Cumbust came to camp, absolutely exploded. Dan Mullen offers him. He commits on the spot the day after he gets an Ole Miss offer. And what's funny about that is, of course, after he commits, the Ole Miss media says, oh, we never really offered. Doesn't matter. Uh, Brad's been a great baseball player for Mississippi State, and uh, I think if he had stuck with one sport, he'd have been an outstanding football player as well. Really like Brad a lot, like his family a lot. Uh, I suspect that Brad Cumbus, uh come summertime, is going to be signing a pro baseball contract. Cameron Gardner, kind of a questionable tag, but he was an early commitment to Mississippi State at a Starville High School, came in and had some productivity at times, and it seemed like every time he caught the football it was a first down, like he was a guy that could move the chains. Didn't work out, ultimately transferred. Uh, Shamar Kilby Lane was a guy that a lot of people were really excited about, but never really figured it out. He was a guy that was a, you know, a great tackler, but was not a guy that, um, you know, the, the, the people said, yeah, hey, this is a guy that's going to do a great job for Mississippi State, and then did it. You know, the expectations were high, but the production really wasn't. Nice young man, just didn't make a lot of tackles. We also signed... A couple other guys that didn't qualify that year. Malik Heath, remember him? Still around. Got an update. He went home from the hospital yesterday. 
John Carice Patterson, we elected not to re-sign him, and LaDamian Webb out of Beauregard, Alabama, former Mr. Football in the state of Alabama. So there's a look back at a handful of classes. And again, it's like on signing day, it looks one way, and then in hindsight, it looks another. But I would venture to say that you know, these last couple of classes we've talked about, we've gotten our value out of them. We've gotten some guys that could play. And what's interesting is it's not the headliners. I mean, like you look at this particular class, people were excited about Devontae Jason, never did anything. We're excited about Stephen Guidry, incredibly inconsistent. We were so excited about Jalen Maiden, uh, never started here. And so that's, you know, three of your four stars that never contributed. But you get a little deeper on the list here, and you look at Buki Watson, and you look at Sean Preston, Jed Johnson, uh, Cam Jones and Cam Young, those guys not only are great productive players, but they're guys that are just kind of playing their way into some other opportunities. And so it's never as good or as bad as it seems, but with the gift of hindsight, we can look back and say, you know what, I, we, we probably did okay. We probably did okay. All right, so let's talk about the next part of the class. The final segment is brought to you by Portico. I've told you guys before, if I was moving to Starkville now, I would move to Portico. I like Portico. I like where it's located. It's 1.1 miles from campus. It's very easy to get to. You turn off of 82 on the 12. You take the very first right, brings you right to it. That's how close you are to campus. But you're on the right side of campus, the quiet side, the residential side of campus, not too far from that neighborhood market. So if you forget to pick up a you know, a loaf of bread, a container of milk, or a stick of butter, you can go by and pick it up on the way home. You don't have to go fight all that traffic or take the bypass all the way around. You can get a two-bedroom, two-bath home up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home. And here's the deal. Phase one, completely sold out. Phase two, you can be a part of the construction process. You can pick your lot. You can pick your house plans. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to maybe have a ball game retreat. So maybe it's your primary residence. Maybe it's an investment property. Or maybe it's just where you keep all your tailgate stuff and where you spend the night when you come watch the Bulldogs play. Either way, your needs can be met. Very, very exciting uh, when you think about the possibilities. My good friend, Brooks Bryan, and he can be your good friend too, is part of this great group that's brought this wonderful residential development to Starkville to help Starkville be a better place to live. It's a wonderful place. It's God's country. It's getting better every day. We've got new construction happening all over our town. We're happy to see it. So give Brooks a call today at 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601 601- 416-8075. Make Portico your next move. All right, let's talk about cornerback recruiting a little bit here. And, uh, you know, every, the last couple of years, it's been a bit of a, bit of a wild ride, right? And um, let's go back to last year. You know, we end up dropping some guys late. And um, I'm never a big fan of that, but here's the thing. The reality of it is, is we expect these coaches to go win football games. And if they think a guy can't play, if they're worried that a guy's not going to be able to to acclimate and play at a high level here at Mississippi State, then they need to make that decision. they got to move some guys on. That happened last year. It wasn't a lot of fun, but it happened. So last year we signed Corey Ellington as a safety. And there was some discussion, too. It's like, you know, do we take this guy, do we not? We take him, and now there's a lot of discussion that he is – one of your better freshman defensive back. They think that he is going to develop into a starter. We also signed Jay Hampton and William Hodrick. Jay Hampton gets the offer from Mississippi State on signing day and commits a couple days later uh, during the signing period. So he was able to sign in December. And he is a wide receiver learning to play corner, a very long, lean, athletic guy. William Hardrick, a guy, of course, we take from Arkansas State and uh, sign him late. And he did some things in the spring, but um, – Either way, we can't stack classes like that, right? We absolutely can't. We can't stack classes like that. we got to go out and get uh, better players. And, of course, we added Jalen Green from the transfer portal. So that helped a little bit. But you begin to look at this and you start thinking, okay, Steve, we had a down year DB recruiting last year. we got to be better this year. And I, I don't disagree with you. I think we have to do a better job. But judging recruiting classes before they're finished is kind of like, you know, judging a ball game at halftime. You know, it's about where you finish, not, no, not where you are. Now, as it stands today, we got a couple of DBs committed. We got William Miller, a safety, 
who will be in this weekend on his official visit. And then we got Adavian Collins out of Newton, Georgia, Covington, Georgia, Newton High School in Covington, Georgia. And he's another guy, too, that uh, has been committed to us for most of the process. We were a little bit worried early on that maybe Auburn or some other schools might get connected with him. Well, so far, that's been okay. It looks like we're going to be good with him. Uh, and so you've got a safety and a corner. But we've had some other guys that we have ultimately kind of moved on from. We've had some other guys that have moved on from us. Uh, the reality of it is, like Jordan Thomas is really the only true decommitment. We had some other guys we took early, got them committed, and either they didn't have a good camp performance or didn't come to compete in camp. And so that, that raises a red flag. And then you begin to kind of scrutinize the senior film. And if guys get senioritis, they can kind of – you know, sick their way right out of an opportunity. So here we are today, two DBs committed. We got to go out and, and get some more. So here's where we stand. Uh, we had talked about uh, Jaquan Farmer out of Coffeyville, Kansas. He was originally set to visit Mississippi State this weekend. I'm told he's not going to have any trouble graduating, but he may end up being a, a spring graduate, which would be a summer enrollment guy. And if we're looking to go get a guy that's going to come in here and compete, at least for a two-deep spot, they need to be here for spring practice. So he's going to visit Kentucky this weekend. I do not expect him to be a part of our class. I don't even really think he's on the board now. I think we've effectively kind of moved on from him. Wish him the best. You know, his final three were supposedly uh, Houston, Texas, San Antonio, and Mississippi State. And uh, now Kentucky's involved late. What's interesting about that is, you know, Kentucky holds the commitment of DeCarlos Nicholson. But yet they're bringing another JUCO corner in this weekend for a visit. Now, reports yesterday out of Oxford is that Ole Miss was expecting to Carlos Nicholson to visit them this weekend. Well, earlier this week, the discussion was Mississippi State was expected to visit, have the visit with him this weekend. Now, Ole Miss was in there yesterday for the in-home visit. So I'm certain they feel confident about it. So here's what I know about the Carlos. And uh, out of Petal High School and uh, is at Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College now, an incredible athlete that is just kind of learning the nuances of playing the position. But if he figures it out, he's going to be outstanding. Very, very talented athlete. Not a lot of experience at corner. But you get him in in spring, he's had the benefit of the season, and then hopefully he's a guy that can perhaps compete on the two deep next year and then be a starter the following year. Uh, but the reality of it is, is you don't ever know what this guy's going to do. You absolutely never know. He is a guy that is very impressionable. He commits to Mississippi State, gets some other offers, decommits, and then he's leaning to Florida State, never follows through with that, out of the blue, commits to Kentucky, says he's done. The next thing you know, he sets visits to go visit Mississippi State uh, and Ole Miss. And then over the weekend, he goes, ah, it's down to Mississippi State and Kentucky. And then Ole Miss is back in it. Auburn still in it. Mike Norvell from Florida State in there on Monday. You know, so – Auburn, not so much. But my point being is that there are a lot of schools that are still kind of jockeying for position with him. And so I won't be the least bit surprised if anything happens with him. He could visit Mississippi State. He could visit Ole Miss. You know, he might go visit PRC for all I know. I mean, he is one of those guys that um, just when you think you've got it figured out, his mind changes. And there are some kids like that. And I hate to call him a kid. I mean, he was basically 20 years old. But there are a lot of young people that – that never went through this process the first time. So now you're in junior college, you're trying to navigate through all this, and you're away from home, and you don't have the benefit of your parents sitting in the living room with you a lot of times. It gets difficult. So I don't think anybody at this point can be certain about what DeCarlos is going to do this weekend, much less next week on National Signing Day. I think the recruiting process for him, you, you say, well, you know, see, we only have a week left. I think it's going to flip-flop a lot between now and signing day. So in I'm no way am I moving on from him or giving up on him. Uh, but I'm also not expecting him at this point. You know, I just think there's still some things left to do and there's still some recruiting left to do and there's still some conversations for him to, to have uh, before we kind of figure out what he's going to do. I do think ultimately the final three are Ole Miss, Kentucky, and Mississippi State. That's where we are right now. Okay, so then there's Kamari Rogers. You guys are familiar with him. Kamari at one point, former number one player in the state, uh, is currently third in the state. Took an official visit to Mississippi State over the weekend. I'm told he had a great time. Told some of the other commitments, man, how great it would be for us to go play together. Now, there is some discussion, too, that 
Miami is trying to get him back on campus this weekend. It's one of those deals where they've made a coaching change, right? They already had taken the official when Manny Diaz is there. Well, they've made a coaching change. So by NCAA rule, they can bring him back to Miami this weekend because they've announced a new coach, Mario Cristobal, yesterday. So they could bring him in this weekend. I don't know if that happens. I know it is being discussed. He remains committed to Miami. There was a lot of discussion about if they made a coaching change, he would officially open things back up. Now, he has worked through this process. You know, you talk some at Ole Miss, ultimately elected not to take an official visit there, uh, and then he comes here. But there is still some work left to do. As I mentioned earlier in the show, there are a lot of people that have forgotten what the exhilaration of official visit weekends feel like, and now you're getting to see it again. So you just don't know. There's just so much left to do, even with a week left. Your coaches are still on the road. They're still having in-person visits. You're going to host players this weekend. You hope everybody shows up, but somebody could change your mind and go somewhere else, or you may pull somebody else in late. I mean, there's just a lot that goes on here at the end. And that's the case with Kamari Rogers. There's a lot still going on with him. I do believe it is Mississippi State in Miami. Will he visit Miami this weekend? Will he stay home? We don't know. That's why you keep up with it, right? You depend on us to get that information for you. We'll do the best we can. Okay, and so that's kind of where we are right now. I'm hearing the possibility of another uh, cornerback prospect taking an official visit this weekend to Mississippi State that hadn't been reported yet. I'm trying to confirm that, and I will do that hopefully later today, and you can read about that over at jeanspage.com, the Mississippi State affiliate for 247 Sports. But you add – let's say you get three of the four – yeah, I think when you begin to kind of break this thing down, because I think there's some other safety prospects out there too that we're chasing. But you, let's say you get a Davian Collins, and then you've got these other guys you're chasing. You get a couple more of those guys, you, and maybe you go to the portal to get a fourth guy. You know, we'll see. But I think this could end really poorly, or this could end really, really well, depending on how we finish. And I know there's some people listening, well, Steve, I know how this is going to end. Well, no, you don't. You don't know how this is going to end because you've got DeCarlos Nicholson, who has been incredibly unpredictable throughout this process. You have Kamari Rogers that is still facing the possibility of, you know what, going to South Florida. And while great that would be, that's a long way from home. It's an incredibly long way from home. Or you can go to Mississippi State and your family and friends can be a part of the experience. So, we'll, you know, we'll see how things progress there. And then you don't know who this mystery cornerback prospect is. And, again, I'll, I'll confirm some things and I'll share it with you when I can. If you're looking for an update over that, you can find it at jeanspage.com. Uh, this evening. Uh, So, again, a lot of things in motion. Some guys fall out, other guys fall in, and then we'll kind of move forward and kind of see how things progress. But uh, I'll have a full update on some stuff. Uh, You can find the bones, the recruiting bones, which is what I do uh, during, you know, basically throughout the year uh, for you guys over at jeanspage.com. Did 10 yesterday, excuse me, did 10 what day is it? Goodness. I did 10 Monday night and did five last night. We'll have five again tonight. And, uh, you know, we're in the heart of things, so you guys are kind of anxious for information. Well, speaking of information, too, let me just advise you of this, too. If you have ordered Dogpile and you're hoping to get it for Christmas, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't think it's going to happen. Nobody has told me officially yet, but I don't think it's going to happen. And so I say that just because I want you to know I have people that are, I get four or five messages a day. We've already pre-sold thousands of these books. And uh, I would say right now the safe bet is just going to be next month. You can say, oh, Steve, I was counting on it. You know, so was I. So was I. And I worked 18 hours a day, six days a week for six weeks with some assurances on the printer side that if we delivered by a certain date, that they could have it out for us late November, early December. And so that's the, op- that's the assumption and the assurances that we operated under and all of a sudden there's this talk, there's a national paper shortage and that sort of stuff. And so there's a lot of things getting bumped. We thought maybe we were kind of getting sold a bill of goods. We talked to our friends in the book industry. We talked to our book vendors. And it's thousands of people in this same situation. Thousands. So I hate it, but it's done. We're just waiting on them to finish printing it. You know, they sent us book jackets and all that sort of stuff. And so everybody's excited about all that stuff. But the reality of it is they're not going to deliver on time. And now I may get a phone call tomorrow that says, hey, they've worked it out and the books will be here Tuesday. That may change. But I'm, I'm just telling you right now to be prepared for that. Now, if you want something to put on the tree, you can get 
dog pile, you can get, excuse me, you get Stark Villains, Alpha Dogs, or Flim Flam, and put that under the tree. Now, you will get an update from the publisher uh, once they get a firm ship date. And, and I have pushed them that we need to do something prior to Christmas, just so everybody knows, because it's going to save me a lot of keystrokes a little bit later. But also, too, you, you people deserve to know. So I've worked hard on it. I'm extremely excited about the book. I'm ready for it to be on the market. I'm ready to get out there and tour again and really have a chance to connect with you guys. And, uh, you know, the, the thing, too, baseball season starts February 18th. That would be a great way to start and be able to kind of recap the season and uh, as you get ready for Bulldog baseball. So that's where we are. Uh, again, getting questions just about daily now. Hey, Steve, what was the website for the shirts? It's starkvillains.com. Starkvillains.com. You can get T-shirts and hoodies there. And uh, there are a lot of people that read Stark Villains that love the cover. And what's crazy, too, is, you know, the publisher tracks all these sales and this sort of stuff. Right now, Stark Villains is the best-selling book in the catalog, not named Dogpile. So it's selling more than Flim Flam. It's selling more than Alpha Dogs. It's selling more than Bloomsville Leander. I don't know what's changed. I don't know why all of a sudden people got excited. Maybe it's just Christmas and we're getting caught up. But Stark Villains is selling probably two to one over everything else right now. And so a lot of people love the cover. And I've had a lot of people say, Steve, I'd love to get the shirt. Very simple. Go to StarkVillains.com. I like those hoodies, too. Very durable. Check them out. StarkVillains.com. Could be a nice Christmas gift for somebody that you know. All right, I'm going to get out of here because I'm much later doing this. i got to eat at some point, right? I want to thank you guys for your support of the Boneyard and of Jeans Page all these many years. If you're not a member, you should be. Check us out at JeansPage.com. I'll be back on Friday, and we'll be previewing the weekend visits. And uh, even then, I don't think we're going to know for sure. You know, we'll have an expected list of, uh, you know, of guests. But um, this time of year, funny things happen in recruiting. That's going to do it for today. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies, and people can see a difference in the way we live. Hello, Discover here. To explain our cash back match, here's how it works. We give you cash back for using your Discover card on the things you were going to buy anyway. Then we match that cash back in your first year. And that's why we call it Cash Back Match. Now to recap and say cash back one more time. We match all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year automatically. Discover. Exceptionally common sense. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Limitations apply. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty? sizzling to perfection it's time to cheer for egg mcmuffin and fresh cracked eggs at mcdonald's it's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest to goodness morning meal breakfast it's on at mcdonald's now get any breakfast sandwich for just two bucks available only through the app mobile order and pay available at participating mcdonald's mcd app download and registration required